Do you struggle with the work that you're doing? Do you dislike your job? Do you love your job? Are you looking forward to your career or your future and wondering what is necessary here and now? We're gonna go into this and a lot more in this episode, so stay with us. Today's handshake is the virtue of diligence. This is persistence in doing good work, even when it's difficult. We all get tired at work, we all find frustrations at work, but diligence is a virtue that helps us persevere when things get difficult. So let's cultivate as men the virtue of diligence and work hard even when it's hard. Hey everyone. Thanks for joining us on another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. We are your hosts, Sam Guzman and John Heinen. We are blessed to be here and we're excited that you would decide to join us in this time to discuss work. But before we do that, we've got a favor to ask. If you could like and subscribe on either the podcast player or YouTube player of your choice and share these episodes out with your friend. Maybe it's not this episode. Maybe it's one of our other episodes um, that we touch on. It would help us so much because that little grassroots helps expand this uh, ministry, expand our audience uh, to reach more men like you uh, so that we can continue to help bring authentic masculinity through the mind and heart of the church to more men in this world and in need. And finally, if you are inspired, if we have inspired you, if you love what The Catholic Gentleman is about and what we're trying to do, and you want to help us reach more men, please consider donating to us at patreon.com slash Catholic Gentleman. We have tiers for every different level, every different financial level, and we'd love anything that you can give us. We are dependent on our donors, and we thank those of you who are currently donating to us. Yeah, so let's talk about work. Uh, it's a topic that is very relevant to us as men. Um, most men have some job or vocation uh, uh, or another. Um, but why is this topic so important in our days? Yeah, I agree. And I think it is so important because more and more, for various reasons, layers and layers of an onion that we will unpack a little bit in this episode, there is a certain culture of contempt for work, right? Mm -hmm. There is a certain uh, frustration with either having to work or the current job that you are in. And um, and this, this is not everyone, for sure, right? There are definitely plenty of virtuous, holy men who... Um, uh, maybe are struggling to get a job, you know, and in, in, in needing those prayers and those um, those discernments. But in general, right there again, this 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 culture of contempt that that we have, and and this kind of me first, and I just want the next promotion, and I just want to raise, and why don't more people pat me on the back? And I did this great thing, and why am I not getting the affirmation that I deserve? Yeah. It's just kind of bred within us in our society, mm -hmm. and so we want to kind of unpack today what it means to work and, and why we should work and hopefully help um, our listeners understand uh, the virtue of work. Yeah, and you know, it, it is such an important point because I think there's a, been a subtle shift in our culture, uh, in our society's way of thinking around work where the value has gone from the work itself to the financial aspect. Mm -hmm. And if someone could figure out how to game the system and, and you know, work that four hour work week and still make, you know, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars a year, they're going to do it. That's right. Because work is just the means to an end, which is lots and lots of money. That's right. Well, no, let's let's step back here, you know, and we, we see in the Garden of Eden where prior to even the fall, before sin, the need to make a livelihood the work by the sweat of our brow, before that was even in the picture, mm. God gave Adam and Eve a job mm -hmm. to tend and garden, care for creation, care for all the creatures in creation. So we see that work was there from the very beginning. Work is a reflection of God's own creativity, his own ability to work, which we saw in the you know the six days of creation. 
God kind of exercising His own creative ability. And so we have that capacity as well, and it brings honor and glory to God when we work well, regardless of the profit or or the financial reward. So I think we need to kind of recover the value of work, like you're saying. Yeah, I agree. I think we should talk about the virtue of work. And so when we talk about work, there is an objective and a subjective value to work. There's the objective, and that's actual job that we're doing. You, you work at Sonic, you're a marketing professional, you know, you're a car salesman. But then there's also the subjective aspect of it, and that's really the virtue of work that's built within our hearts, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I think we can't, we should go further into this, and we can't uh, understate this and, and or overstate this, and that, that's the fact that created in the image and likeness of God, work is a part of our very essence, of our very reality, right? And the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 2004, 28 paragraph, you know, talks about that. It talks about how we actually resemble the visible image of God when we are actively involved in work. And so uh, that's built within our hearts. And I think that we, we ignore this, right? But you're right, the four hour work week, passive income, rich dad, poor dad, yeah, right? right? Like all of these different ways to get rich and to be wealthy and then to not have to work and your real life happens when you retire. Attitude is missing the whole reality of why we work, right? In, in, in Genesis, you brought up, um, God said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth, right? In, in the act of subduing the earth, right? Indirectly showcases the fact that we have to work. We can't sit back drinking Mai Tais on a beach and subdue the earth. It yeah. <laughs> doesn't work that way, you know? And so, um, we do, however, live in a very different time than, um, say, 500 years ago, uh, where some of these things came very naturally. But that subjective reality hasn't changed, that we as men are required to work, to, um, to be productive in life, and to showcase the visible, uh, that which is invisible in yeah. God. Yeah, and I think why is why is work taking such a bad rap in our culture? Well, and one aspect of it is that without God in the picture, things kind of collapse into this materialist paradigm where the highest good, the summum bonum, you know, of, yeah. of life is pleasure. Yeah, maximum pleasure, minimum suffering. So the greatest evil in life is suffering. Yeah. Well, effort is a kind of suffering. It like it. You know, you're sweating, you're straining, you're actually you're flexing your muscles, you're, you're struggling. And a lot of people in our materialistic world see effort as the greatest evil. So, we, you know, we've talked about before how we're trying to create this frictionless society where nothing requires any effort. You know, everything's a smart device. Yeah. Everything does everything for you. Everything's automatic. You know, we, we got a new van recently. All the doors and windows and everything, the seats, everything's automatic. All you have to do is just press a button. And at first, I thought it was kind of ridiculous. Like, oh, you know, I can't even lift my, my, my lift gate on my van on my own. Mm -hmm. It has to go up automatically. But then I got used to it. And I'm like, hey, this is kind of nice. It's effortless. All I have to do is just press a little button on my keychain and the van door goes up. You know, it's it, but it, the society's programming us to see any kind of effort as like intrinsically evil. Yeah. And just let everything just be automatic, frictionless, so easy. Yeah. You know, and it kind of lulls us into this complacency and and since work requires effort and therefore a little bit of suffering, we run from it. Yeah, and, we do. and that's the exact wrong attitude that we're supposed to have. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it it is, and actually, but it's been built within us too, right? So we're not we're not void. We're not um, higher than 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 thou in this sense. It, it's been a feeling uh, that I've struggled with uh, a, a lot, right? I mean, who doesn't want to live like a king or a paradise on earth, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that temptation is so strong, and the world encourages it, right? That uh, the world wants you to to experience that and to to desire that, and then to be dissatisfied when you haven't achieved that at such a young age. And it exemplifies, you know, the Mark Zuckerbergs, the the individuals that um, 
um, were intelligent and uh, and did well. Uh, but you know, at the same time, you have individuals like Mark Rober or stuff like that who are still working and still passionate and still enjoying it. But they did incredibly well at a young age. He went to MIT, became a NASA employee, you know, and things like that. There's also a really great Catholic who um, um, works down at NASA in Houston, um, a guy named Johnny, who is. Um, uh, one of the youngest men ever to be in the front room of mission control. And, um, but he's a devout Catholic and he's still working and he still loves it. And, and there's, there's such a, a um, such a, a joy and fruit in that, right? Of not just sitting back, we've achieved the highest ideal and now we can just rest and be at ease. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we need to, we need to pray and discern that. In fact, uh, to that point, I'm going to drop in the show notes, uh, some, Catechism of the Catholic Church references, as well as uh, John Paul II's 1981 encyclical uh, Laborum uh, Exorcens, where, where you, if you have time and desire, you can you can dive more into this this subjective reality of work. You know? Yeah, yeah. So the right attitude to work. Let's talk about that. We kind of talked about what we shouldn't think, but what yeah. should we think? Um, and and one of the ways that I think uh, we need to uh, think about work is giving thanks for the ability to do it, first of all. But second, find joy and give thanks for those tasks, no matter how mundane. Yeah. Um, which is radically countercultural. Mm. I mean, how many people work in McDonald's and all they can do all day long is complain about how horrible McDonald's is. That's right. Or they work in a factory pressing a button, you know, and, and operating a machine all day long, and it feels so monotonous and so meaningless. But St. Paul challenges us who, by the way, was a tent maker. He knew how to work. That's right. But he, St. Paul challenges us. He says, whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything, everything, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Yeah. And that's, that's Colossians 3.17, yeah. I believe it is. But the point being, whatever you do, do it with a thankful and, and grateful heart, and people are going to be shocked by that. Like, mm -hmm. talk about evangelization. That's going to be, like, the most radical thing. Like, I'm so glad I can come to work today at my monotonous, boring job. Like, yeah, people exactly. are just going to, their mind's going to be blown. But do it with joy and with a, an attitude of gratefulness, and uh, people will take, take note of that. I agree. And it's something that we can look to the lives of the saints for. And I, I know that there's a couple that we've talked about uh, previously, but... Uh, well, like one of them is Saint Andre Bassett, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, he uh, there in Montreal, right? What an amazing saint! And in practically speaking, he was the Walmart greeter, right? Yeah, right? He was the man who stood there, said hi to everybody, directed them if you were returning something, if you needed something, yes. right? But he had such a passion for people and such a devout love of Christ and Our Lady that he became this glorious saint that people were coming to for spiritual direction and for healing. Or we have St. Martin of Pours, right? I like to talk about him too, where basically for years he just collected the hair uh, at a barber shop, right? Like that was his job was, was men would go get their hair trimmed and he was an apprentice and his job was just to clean up hair, right? Yeah, right. And, and, but he saw such value and worth. And of course we have like the little flower in St. Therese and we have, we have these individuals that talk about it, but there's so much truth in, in it, right? Is that we have to give thanks to God for that which he has given us, even if it is something that is boring and is monotonous, is, is just a labor because in and of itself, it really has a connection to God in a way that we are being God's hands and feet here on the earth and can truly evangelize others through our demeanor and through our mentality in this. And these questions have been asked to us so many times, right? So when we had the question and answer episode or outreach, we got a handful of questions wondering the same thing is like, you know, how do I, how do I view work? You know, I, I hate my job, you know, that sort of thing. I worked at Sonic for two and a half years. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember doing, doing the labor and being the car hop and everything like that. But, um, did you have roller skates? I, I did not. I uh, was very bad, clear huh? that <laughs> if I were on roller skates, I would lose more money for Sonic <laughs> than I would, I would make them. So yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah, we've all had those jobs, and 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 the, that that might be someone's question on uh, on their mind as they're yeah. hearing us talk about this. Well, you know, I uh, I have this job. I don't like it. I'm not making enough money. Maybe I need to provide for my family. I need to 
climb climb a little bit like is it wrong to be dissatisfied in in a, in any way mm -hmm. like to say i need to move up or i need to find a different path and and uh, so let's talk about that for a little bit uh yeah yeah agreed and so uh, no, it's not wrong to want to provide for your family within reason, right? Um, my wife and I drive around and we live really close to uh, a couple of neighborhoods with mansions and yeah. then, right like 5,000, 6,000 square foot homes. And um, we constantly remind ourselves is we are not meant to live like kings in this earth yes. um, because there is a desire that temptation of the world right there is is on it you know it's front and center and you know who wouldn't want to live with that manicured yard you know wait staff you know or just a huge house that uh, that you know looks magnificent but the point being is that's not what we're called to do right and so again i say within reason but it's not wrong to want to provide and and i think it's really important for us to be clear about that men who are struggling to provide for their families um, need our prayers and, and need some of these other tools of, of discernment um, that that we're going to talk about yeah. but one thing that um I would be remiss if we didn't mention um, is is kind of the attitude to the work that we are invested in right here and now, um, meaning your day in and day out job. And one of the attitudes that I adopted uh, later on, unfortunately, I didn't adopt this early, but I'd encourage people who are in this situation, maybe your first five, six, seven years of a career, and you are struggling with your job and looking forward to the next raise, the next promotion, is instead focus on your skill sets, right? There is incredible value in focusing on what you're learning and being proactive in that, right? So an individual who is a director of sales might learn a little bit about marketing. An individual mm -hmm. who is in marketing might learn a little bit more about sales or might learn a little bit more about a new platform that's coming out or spend some time in the evenings getting certified in something. Or maybe, and this is just, I'm just gonna throw this out here, software developers are in huge demand and make a lot of money. And so maybe in the evenings, you're gonna to go to YouTube University and you are just going to start learning yeah. how to code Python or how to code um, you know, C Sharp or Java or something like that. Maybe that's what you're going to work on is expanding your skill set. And I am a living testament to what expanding your skill set can do for job opportunities in the future to provide for your family, right? Not with the goal of just making more money, but with the goal of doing what is is good and just in the eyes of the Lord uh, for your family and for your loved ones. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And and no one enough is enough. You know, I think yeah. that's one of the problems we have as Americans is knowing what enough is enough, like, you know, I make six figures, and then I got to make seven figures, you know, and just got to keep climbing. But, but yeah, I think that, that um, expanding your skill set, uh, education in the right way, um, is absolutely a, a key ingredient in career success. So, so well, um, the short answer is, the, if the question was, yeah. you know, uh, is it ever right to move up? The answer is absolutely. Yes. But do it for the right reasons. Don't mm -hmm. do it out of like a, a vain ambition. Or, but do it for the right reasons. I need to provide for my family or I want to contribute in some way. Thank God for all the wealthy Catholics out there who have helped build our churches and funded our schools and things like that. So very That's successful, true. wealthy people can really contribute. So there's nothing wrong in and of itself with being successful. Just do it for the right reasons. And often... If you are diligent, you are faithful, you are doing your work with joy and care, your good success will take care of itself. That's right. You know, people take note. They'll say, hey, that guy needs a promotion or whatever. That's right. Even if he does, even if you don't get that though, people are going to pay attention and say, that guy's a great worker. Great workers are in our in 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 are very hard to come by these days. So true. So be the kind of worker where people can say, I want to hire that guy because he's a Catholic and Catholics work hard. You That's know, right. That kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Be that, be that, in the, be that Catholic gentleman. Yeah, yeah. I completely agree with you is do a great job regardless of what you're doing. Uh, when I was at Sonic, I did a great job and mm -hmm. I worked diligently. I did not sit back and look at my phone or waste time. Right. 
these were different times. So we yes, didn't have right. smartphones first and foremost, fair enough. But we, uh, but I did work very diligently and, and very, um, uh, very focused. And, and another thing is don't be closed off to the promptings of the spirit. And in the promptings of the spirit, I mean, closed off to the opportunity to evangelize and the opportunity to be a witness to people that you work with, right? And in that opportunity, we can be an example yeah. for others, right? Man, this guy works really hard. He's always filled with joy. He's choosing happiness and not sullen or bitter or annoyed or complaining about others, right? Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I like to look at, and I bring up my father um, or his generation, for instance, as an example, is that my dad did not love his job. You know, he worked for 40 years diligently for the family in a, uh, a career that provided for our family. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, over the top uh, luxurious or, you know, or filled with, with a whole lot of meaning, but he understood that subjective value of work and he worked for our family. And my dad was a great example of this. My dad also didn't whine and complain. He didn't whine and complain to his friends, but he built a fraternity of like-minded men at work, or mm -hmm. even some men who wanted to be a part of that 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 group, right? And so, you know, till this day, my dad's been retired for a while, and he still goes on Fridays to coffee with a couple individuals that are now retired uh, that he worked with. Um, not all of them Catholic, but my dad is a great example uh, for what's possible and what we can be working on. So look for those opportunities. Be open to the Holy Spirit's prompting and guidance within these um, moments in in your day in and day out objective job, whatever that might be. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point because a lot of people say, uh, well, I have to have a passion for what I do or you know, I don't really want to do a job I don't like. Mm -hmm. And so there's this distinction between a career and a job. You know, and, and I think that that's fair. You know, yeah. we all want to do something that we like. And I think mm -hmm. the ideal situation is a an intersection between what you like to do, what you're good at, what the world needs, yeah. and your ability to make money. Mm -hmm. If you can align all those stars in God's providence, then by all means do so. But sometimes we only meet a couple of those requirements. You know, we're, we're good at something, but we don't necessarily like it um, or whatever. Um, and it all comes down to your responsibilities as in your vocation in life. If you're a husband and father, and you've been looking for that job that you're absolutely passionate about, and you just can't find it, mm. all you can find is a job that pays the bills, even though you don't love it. Well, then your number one responsibility is, first of all, do the job you don't like and pay the bills, yeah. okay? Because your first responsibility is to your family. Mm. Now, if you can do that, you can pay the bills, and you can do something you love, then by all means, seek that job that that you can you can enjoy going to work every day and 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 that is very aligned with your skill set, your personality, that sort of thing. So um, I will say like it, it, if you're a, hus a husband and father like your dad was, yeah. do your duty, yeah. provide for your family. But if you can also find a job that that aligns with your personal, sense of meaning and values, then, then by all means do so. Um, so I think, to my mind, the distinction between a job and a career, a career being um, a job that you love, yeah. uh, a job that you want to spend the rest of your life doing. But uh, not everyone gets to have that, you know? I That's mean, right. my, my, uh, my, my great-grandpa, uh, yeah. he just pu punched a button in a factory for 40 years. Another grandpa, great-grandpa shoveled coal uh, and just fired a, an engine in a in a uh, in a glass making factory, yeah. for, you know, for forty years. Yeah. And, but he provided for his family, and so ultimately, duty comes first. Yeah, passion comes second. I like it. Yeah, I think that's a great principle to to help guide and to discern. And at the same time, you might find a job that gives you passion and purpose, uh, and it provides for your family, but other jobs that pay more money along the same career path present themselves. Mm -hmm. And you have to do that discernment, right? Of whether I should move for this. I know that I have experienced that directly a handful of times. I'm currently in a job that I find a, a degree of passion and purpose, right? It doesn't come without 
um, difficulties. There's still the day in and day out suffering and the grind that we all have. And I have to constantly remind myself the virtue of labor and how, yes. how I'm called to do this uh, and do my diligence regardless of whether I'm happy or not or, or really like it, right? Um, but I have been uh, offered jobs that pay a quite a bit, I've got a lot more money than, than I currently um, am making, but I've had to to take it to discernment. Sometimes it's really easy, right? It's like, yeah, I mean, I could I could make that, but I would be doing that, and therefore, I know I'm not I'm not going down that road, right? Exactly. Right, and so we have to do that. But what if you're just discerning a job change? Like, what if what if you are discerning taking yourself to the next level? Maybe you are working forty hours a week, but you're not in a salaried insurance four hundred one k job. Maybe you are in one of those, but you're trying to look to take yourself up to the next level because the job, um, career pa- career company that you're with doesn't have that opportunity, right? Um, maybe you're at um, an entry level position and you really want to move up to more of a manager position, and you feel like you have the experience. You know, how do we discern these things, and how do we uh, go through them? So there's some principal discernments that I think are important uh, for us to talk about. So the first thing that I'd like to talk about is prayer. And so in my career and in my life, anytime this has come up, I turn it to prayer. I actually turn it to novenas and I turn it to St. Joseph, right? So I turn it to St. Joseph because St. Joseph is the patron saint of workers. And I have. So when I was looking for my first full-time job to do from the 40 hours a week to actually make salary to make insurance. Um, I prayed an an incessant novena. It wasn't just nine days. It was a lot longer than that. And I just kept on praying it over and over and over until an opportunity presented itself that was a really good fit for my current skill sets. Maybe didn't provide all the passion and purpose. Maybe I thought it did. And then I found out later it didn't. Nevertheless, when I switched from that company to another company, I did the same thing. I turned to a nine-day novena to St. Joseph. So um, I encourage us first to turn to prayer when yeah. we're discerning these things. Yeah, and I can second that too. When I first was entering the workforce, my very first real job, quote-unquote, mm-hmm. where I had uh, the salary and the benefits that you're talking about, well, it was a great job. And it was a great uh, a Protestant ministry, actually, mm-hmm. in um, in Colorado where I lived at the time. But then I had this, you know, crisis of faith, and I ended up converting to Catholicism. Mm. And I didn't want to keep working for a Protestant ministry as a Catholic, um, so I knew I was going to end up quitting that job. But it was scary, you know. I was I was newly married. We were barely making it as it was, you know. Would God provide you know, another job for me? I don't know. But I, I just I pr- committed it to prayer and just stepped out in faith, and I got on Craigslist like uh, the same week that I decided to look for another job. And we were in a big office complex at the time. And I, I saw on Craigslist that a company was hiring. <clears throat> and I said, that that name sounds so familiar. And I said, I looked out the, the front door of the office and it was the office directly across the hallway <laughs> from the office where I was working at the time. Oh. So I literally just printed off my resume, walked across the hallway and said, I'm looking for a job, will you hire me? And they got back to me in a day or two and said, yeah, we'll hire you. So I walked across the hallway and started my new job. God provided. Oh, funny. So, you know, sometimes it's a struggle, though. And, and we have to step out in faith. And it can be scary, you know. And and as, as men, having a growing family is, lights a great fire under you to continue to provide. And, you know, families can be expensive. So, but yeah. step out in faith. Prayer Prayer works. I mean, people just think that prayer is just wishful thinking a lot of times, but no, like God can do miracles. I agree. And so there are some more, more thorough discernments out there, like the Ignatian discernment, right? And, and you can literally Google Ignatian discernment for job change or career change, and you're going to get things um, which are really great. And, and they're going to start out with prayer in thanksgiving to God for the blessings he has given you, the skills he has given you, and the opportunity to discern something different. Then if something's presented to you, right, you've got that pros and cons list. My wife and I have had to do this many times where we literally, on a piece of paper, write down the pros of taking on this new job and the cons of taking on this job. Yep. And and we discern that together because there are always pros and cons. And if you don't see the cons, then you aren't really thinking through this. Um, 
It could be like, I'm going to have to work 60 to 70 hours a week, or it could be, I'm going to have to travel more frequently, or it could be, I don't get to come home for lunch. Whatever the case might be, there are always some cons that we want to to look at in those pros and cons. The next thing is, is we take it back to God, right? We give it to him. We offer up our prayer and thanksgiving. We ask him for his holy will to be upon us and to illuminate our minds and make straight our path. We go through that. And then I am a big, big, big proponent of seeking other advice, right? Going and seeking counsel from a spiritual director or a priest or somebody who is accomplished in in a certain career a path or yes. a career field, you know, do that, do that diligence to, to, um, or the due diligence in this case of, of going through and, and doing that. And then ultimately we have to make a decision, right? Don't allow yourself to fall into the never ending spiral of indecision. Yes. And so there's some really good books out there. There was uh, some really great podcasts too about different military uh, leaders that have had to learn this trait of like, we have to weigh the balance, weigh the options, and then we have to make a decision that could indeed win, could lose lives, could, you know, mm-hmm. and how do you make that decision? How do you not get paralyzed? We have to take that to God. We have to confidently know that we've done the steps necessary to discern that, and then we have to make that decision. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you're someone who just graduated from college, maybe, yeah. and you have no work experience, um, you might be thinking, well, what about me? I don't know what I'm good at. I don't know what kind of career I want. Maybe I think I like this job, but I actually hate it. You know, what, what do I do? I do want to put a plug in there for uh, career counseling. There's yeah. um, a whole field of people who are just specialized in uh, helping people find that perfect alignment between their skill set, their interests, their ability to make money, where there's a need in society, all of those things. And there's some really amazing um, like assessments and personality tests and things like that that you can take that can really help clarify, this is what I'm good at. Um, this is the best career path for me, um, based on my, who I am as a person. And, uh, so I'd encourage people to, to look into that. Even if you don't go see a professional, like there's assessments out there that will help you narrow it down because mm-hmm. there's, there's tens of thousands of different career possibilities or, or job possibilities. And it can be a real help to have kind of an objective assessment of, of your personality and your skill set that can help you make those decisions. And also, people go through midlife crisis or something like that and they feel like they need to start over. Those kinds of assessments can really be helpful in that regard as well. Yeah, I agree. And so, one of the final things that we like to talk about, because it's the Catholic gentleman, right? It's about um, presenting yourself gentlemanly or manly. And and so, one of those areas is the interview process, right? And how do we uphold ourselves in interviews? And how do we uh, present ourselves as the right candidate for the job? Right, yeah. Well, the first thing I would say is like have a great resume and especially a good cover letter. I think Mm -hmm. cover letters too, oftentimes they get more attention than the actual resume itself. So if you can pitch yourself really well, briefly and articulately, like I am the right person for this job, and here, check out my resume. It proves it. Yeah, like that can really go a long way. But then a nice, concise resume that just hits the highlights. People yeah. don't need to know your life story. They don't need to know how much you weigh, mm-hmm. uh, or how old you are, or any of those right. things. Just know the highlights. Like this is what I can do. This is the jobs I've had. Uh, I'm the right person for this job. But yeah. So in talking about resumes, I think it's really important to remember that your resume is your marketing slick, right? Yep. It is supposed to be your Instagram account in the sense of you're just showing off the best of yourself, right? In a a short, concise manner. And it's really important to have other people to look at your resume, right? It's also really important to speak the language of the job you're applying for. So people don't think about that. But if you're going to a startup company, maybe the career opportunity is there and um, the value and the benefits are there, but it's a startup company, then you want to use words like ingenuity and resourcefulness and yeah. things like that in your resume. You want to speak the language of these people and what they're looking for. If you're going to a large Berkshire Hathaway, you know, Warren Buffett, you know, Geico or Burlington Northern Santa Fe or some sort of company like that, you want to use uh, the words of like resiliency or steadfastness or, you know, diligence, yes. you know, like where 
talking about because they're looking for people that are going to show up to work on time. They're going to show up um, uh, alert. They're going to be efficient and working hard at their job. Some other words, you know, that are coming to mind. And you want to put that into your resume because you are speaking the language of the position in the company that you're working for. So those yeah. are really important. And I notice them all the time. So I, I've gone through hundreds of resumes and immediately I can see when somebody's just been told something at college and they've been told how to write a resume versus somebody who's had some real spiritual, uh, sorry, some real career coaching yeah. on, on what to look for. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And let's say, let's say you polish your resume, you get the interview. Wow. Yeah. How exciting. You know, go in there though with, with confidence. I think, you know, I hold oh my word. I was so bad at this <laughs> when I was fresh out of college and I was trying to go in for an interview you know, I have one, one guy I shook his hand and he said, why are your palms so sweaty? And I was like, oh, shoot, <laughs> you know, I'm nervous. That's yeah. why. You know, and I was looking at the floor and I was just awkward and, and not confident. Who wants to hire somebody like that? Yeah. You know, so really what you need to do is go in there and act like I can do this job. You'd be lucky to have me. I'm the, I've got what it takes. Okay. Right. You know, every one of those things on your requirement list, I can nail it. I've got what it takes. Yeah. Give me a chance. You know, and a lot of, a lot of people, if you don't believe that you can do the job, why would anyone else believe that's it? That's so true. And actually what we're talking about here is preparation, right? Yes. And so I have uh, coached a number of people on, on careers or music or things like that. And one of the biggest things is, is being prepared for an mm -hmm. interview. So yeah. by that, you have to put forth the time of answering questions on the fly. Yeah. You have to put forth the time of coming up with questions. I can't tell you the amount of interviews that I've done and I've asked them what questions you have for us and they don't have any questions. And that's a big letdown, right? Because we need to know somebody is is a thinker and somebody is, is willing to, um, you know, um, critically uh, apply their uh, their thoughts to this job or to mm -hmm. this interview setting, right? Yes. So have that list of questions. Make sure if those questions were answered in the interview, you don't ask it again. I've had that happen too. Um, but also preparing for the unknown. Yeah. So I feel like uh, when I'm, again, coaching people, if 14 days before an interview that you're really hoping to get you literally meet with a friend, a loved one, and you have just a mock interview. It can be five, 10 minutes. That's all it takes. But they just ask random questions and you have to think on your feet. That way, when you go into the interview setting, it's interview number 15, not interview number one, right? Yes. Because you've been, you've been mm -hmm. really practicing that and preparing for it. And it seems simple, um, but it's often overlooked. And then the one value uh, that, and the only reason I thought about this is because you're talking about the, the nervousness, is that um, it helps you with confidence. It helps you avoid nervousness, right? Mm -hmm. There's gonna be a heightened thing, but you have kind of prepared for this. Yes. And so that's an incredibly valuable you an important um, point in, in carrying yourself well within an interview. Yeah, yeah. they say competence breeds confidence. There you yeah. go. And so if you've, done the, if you've done the homework, you've done the preparation, you can be fully confident when you go into that interview. So. That's right. And it doesn't have to be arrogance. And if you are a man, a Catholic gentleman, it's, it, it, arrogance is not... Um, uh, overly, um, you know, in abundance. You're, you're not, you're not showcasing that. Really, right? like you have to, you have to really, you know, work on arrogance and constantly always thinking you're better than other people. Yeah. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about confidence that you are the right person for this job. And if they hire you, they're not going to regret it. In fact, I hired a guy last year, and in the interview, he said, "I understand that I might not have the skill set that some of the other people have." And he said, but I promise you, I will put forth the hours and you will not regret hiring me. He said that. I did. I interviewed like 20 people. I hired him and I haven't regretted it. Yes. Like he has lived up to his word in that interview. And that meant a lot for me to hear him say that. So just these little things are, are really important. Yeah. Yeah. So wherever you are in your career journey, I think these are some helpful tips, uh, whether you're just getting started or you're, you know, 20 years into the career field looking for a new job. Um, but work is valuable. I think yeah. that is such an important point, uh, kind of going back to what we were talking about at the beginning. And don't disparage work. Uh, it, it can be a really uh, beautiful gift to the world, 
where you can contribute to society, you can contribute um, to your company, you can be an example, a witness, and evangelize. Uh, so don't disparage work and don't see it as a means to an end, which is vacations or retirement. Mm -hmm. No, it's an end in itself. Work is a way to glorify God uh, and to imitate Him. That's so true. We're not promised tomorrow. So we live now as good, holy men who are willing to put forth um, the effort necessary to... And if, hey, if you want any spiritual reflections on this, look up St. Jose Maria Escriva. He's all about sanctifying your work, and he's got some incredible things to say. Hey Amen. I couldn't agree more. We're here at the end of our episode. It's time for a nightcap. Uh, the nightcap are things that we appreciate. We've been talking about work a lot, and I think it's important to talk about leisure and yes. to talk about one of our uh, favorite pastimes and leisure, and that is um, pipe smoking, right? right? And so uh, Sam and I both admit that we don't get to do pipe smoking nearly as much as we want because other responsibilities in life um, dictate, and that's that's quite all right. But we decided today to talk about a unique form of pipe smoking, and that is corn cob pipe smoking. That's right. And so yeah. we, we can think about the early settlers and things like that, and we both have corn cob pipes. Um, this pipe that I have, and actually Sam's as well, is a Missouri Meerschaum. Um, what's fascinating is you're not going to get cobs this large in um, in the regular world. Yeah, in you corn. don't find a cob this wide in the grocery store. No, so. so I think it's the University of Missouri, but uh, they were um, hired or they decided to do of their own accord. I actually don't know why, but they started genetically creating uh, corn with larger cobs and, mm -hmm. and smaller kernels for the sake of making pipes. But there's something that I really love about corn cob pipes, and it is that connection to history and yes. that connection to like a certain working man, right? Yeah. You know, I, I picture the man who's out on the plow, you know, with, with the pipe in his mouth, or the man who just finished a long day of labor uh, and has and has a pipe in his mouth to reflect and to, to you know, hopefully pray in, in these manners. And, um, and so that's one reason why I really admire yeah, this. Yeah, well, Mark Twain had a, had a Missouri Meerschaum. Uh, yeah. uh, General MacArthur had one. So you're connected to a lot of uh, uh, significant men in history. But yeah, there's something about the texture of it in your hand and just uh, the whole experience of a corn cob pipe is really great. It's a uniquely American phenomenon, too. In yeah. Europe, they have more of the, the clay pipes and things like yes. that or the briar pipes. But but corn cobs are kind of a, an American thing. Yeah, so. agreed. And I would just say that they're affordable as well. That's another great oh, thing, yeah, right? Yeah. So if if it's something you're interested in getting into, uh, these corn cob pipes are going to cost like ten dollars or less versus you know some pipes that um, that run hundreds of dollars. Yes. And so, um, anyway, so that was the nightcap for tonight. As we end each of our episodes, be a man, be a saint. God bless. Thank you.